Well, we're beginning our study this morning. Uh, Mike Houston was supposed to lead this, but he decided to go to Florida, so he asked me if I'd do it. And I said yes. As most any of you that have been up here, it's a real challenge to figure out what you're going to speak about on short notice. There's so much in the Bible to study that it's not an easy choice. But one of the things in life that I've, I've found is that during my life, I've had points in my religious endeavor to where I would have ups and downs. Sometimes I'd be high, and I'd be all out there. I'm working for the Lord. Other times I'd be low, and I wouldn't be willing to do anything. I'm sure all of us have been in that situation before. Most of my study will be in Hebrews this morning. And Hebrews is sort of an interesting book. And what I'm saying right now has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. I'm trying to fill time up. I, I, I'm trying to figure out how in the world I can eat up 45 minutes. <laughs> so. Hebrews is an interesting book because it used to be in ages past that Paul was considered the writer of that book. I myself still think that Paul did write the book of Hebrews. And I think he wrote it to the Hebrews, the, the Jewish people of that time that, that were Christians. And they were tending to fall away from his gospel of grace that he was bringing to them. The reason I sort of contend that, that Hebrews was written by Paul is by Peter. In 2 Peter, of his last verses there, he, he speaks of, of Paul and the letter that he wrote to them. Peter mostly spoke to the Hebrews and the other epistles that Paul wrote. So I think that's where it's a clue that I believe that uh, Paul wrote it. Now, a lot of commentaries don't believe that. They think it's written by other people. The other places, when you're reading Hebrews, uh, it speaks of running the race. And that was sort of a noted thing for Paul to do, to speak about the Olympics and the racing and this sort of thing. But like I said, again, that's, that's neither here nor now. That's just trying to fill in a little time. Um, in studying the Bible, I, I, I came upon a little note that was interesting when I was trying to prepare for what I'm going to bring here in just a minute. But it read, we can never really understand what the Bible is saying to us now until we appreciate what it was saying to them then. If you study on that just a little bit, it gives us a clue that we need to look what the Bible was saying to them so that we can draw out of it what we want to now. With that being said, if we've been out and we see a building that has been destroyed by fire. It's burnt out. It's been gutted by fire. There's no life in it. But we, we can imagine what at one time that building did contain life. When it was first built, there was a vibrance in it. People were joyful. There was a lot that went on in that building, and we can only imagine what all happened in there. But now, the energy has gone out of that building because of the burnout, and the walls are just there. It's empty. Burnout is not limited to just old buildings. 
us as humans have burnout. We can see that in, in maybe in our own lives. We can see that in other people. A student who starts a year early into the year is full of vigor. He wants to learn. But by the time nine months rolls around, they're sort of down and out. They don't really care about learning anymore. They're ready to have the summer vacation. A worker on a new job, he always goes in the first month or two or three, three or four months of that job. He's learning. He's, he's excited about it. But in time, he knows how to do that job, and it becomes a little bit boring. And he doesn't care about it as much. Now, he's still getting paid, but yet his, his enthusiasm is sort of gone. He's getting burnt out. A top executive, with all the stress that goes in and being a top executive of a big business, when he first comes in, he's exuberant about that. But as years go by, he gets burnt out. We probably in our own lives have done the same and have felt that probably many times. Looking over the crowd, all of us are a little bit uh, long at the tooth. So I'm sure during our lifetime, we've had many burnouts in our life. A dedicated Christian, a dedicated Christian can also have burnouts in their spiritual lives. When we are first become Christians and we're learning about the Lord, we're excited. We We have an intensity about us. We get baptized. We want to feel the Holy Spirit come into our lives. Some of us, that happens upon coming up out of the water. Others don't quite experience that for one reason or the other. Needless to say, we're excited about our new faith. But as time goes on, we sort of we sort of lose interest. We have a little burnout. This in itself is a not a new phenomena. It's one that's been going on for ages. And the Bible itself has many examples of people that have burnouts, that need a spiritual reawakening. In Hebrews 10, if you'll turn with me there, Hebrews 10, 32, 32 33, Like I say, I'm going to say Paul is writing. And he says, but recall the former days in which after you were illuminated. Illuminated, they gained knowledge. You endured a great struggle with suffering, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. In those times, he's, he's having them recall, when you first became Christians, you remember this. Y'all suffered many things for the Lord's sake. You were excited about what was happening. It was a rewarding thing, even though they were suffering these these trials and tribulations during that time, they were still excited. 
I can only imagine how a church service would have been back in that day. They gathered in the homes. They would see each other out on the street. They would recognize each other. When they gained, went into the homes, they would be singing and praying and studying about the life of Jesus. They probably rehearsed this over and over to themselves about what Jesus did. Now remember, this is probably in the first early part, probably 50, 60, 60s uh, AD, 20, 30 years after Christ's crucifixion, death, and burial, and resurrection. They were excited. The stories were fresh on their minds. What were they expecting? At that time, Peter and the twelve apostles, Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, he was made apostle of the Gentiles, us, they were all expecting the return of Christ. This was imminent. They were wanting him to come back, and they thought it would be in their lifetime. They, because of this, could suffer many abuses that was handed out to them because they were, they were Christian in a hostile environment, not like we are today, but they were Christians in a hostile environment. Let's turn to Hebrews 12, 12, just a second. There was, in that time, there was a letdown. I don't know really why, but Paul writes here in 1212, we'll pick it up in just a second. But there was a little letdown in their enthusiasm. And this is what he's writing to them about. It says, recall in your early days. But in 12.12 he says, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. He's telling them, you've let down a little bit, so recall what went on prior to this to where you had the strength and vitality to... to fight to try to bring believers into the faith. To regain some of that vitality that we have. The thrill had gone out of them, out of them, of hearing the message. The years were passing and they saw nothing happening. Like I said, they probably, I don't know for a fact, but they probably were looking for Jesus' return. Imminent, imminent return. Of course, Jesus said, hey, you'll never know the day of the time. But they thought it was going to be in their life, I think. Burnout, I think, happened to them about this time. And Paul's trying to get them rekindled back up. But burnout occurs... When the dreams that we have exceed the capabilities. The Old Testament has many stories of burnouts. If you'll recall Elijah in 1 Kings, 19. Let's turn over there just a minute.
if bring to mind this is a story of Elijah when Jezebel was queen and she was a, she was Jewish but yet she was not a believer she was an idol worshiper as a, as a lot of people during that time were the Jews a lot of Jews were more given to the idol worship than they were to God anyway she was a worshiper of Baal Elijah of course, he was a prophet. And if we go to the story, Elijah was trying to prove who his God was, and he was more powerful than Baal. Elijah was one prophet. Baal prophets were maybe some around 450, pro uh, 450 prophets for Baal. And on Mount Carmel, he challenges them. And the challenge basically is that bring two calves, we'll split them up, you'll put them on your altar, and you will get a fire to come up and sacrifice them. Sacrifice them. Elijah says, I'll do the same. I'm one man but I'll do the same. So the 450 cut up their calf, they build a fire, they put it on, and for nearly a day, they start in the morning and it goes all the way to evening to where they praying to Baal to, to come down and set the fire that will consume the sacrifice. To no avail, it doesn't happen. Elijah then cuts his up, puts some wood in there, and asks that they bring pails of water. He digs a trench around the sacrifice. He builds first the altar out of 12 stones, which represents the 12 tribes. But he puts it there, he digs a trench around it, and it says, bring pails of water. They bring pails of water, and they dump out on it. He does this three times till that trench is full of water. Then he prays to God, and fire comes down and consumes it. Even the water is consumed. He, in retaliation now, because now he's won this contest, but he puts to the sword to those 450 Baal prophets. He's won a great victory. He sees that this could be the turning point in the Jews of that day, that they might see how their God is the most powerful God. He tells Ahab, run down to Jezreel to, to tell, tell Jezebel, Queen Jezebel of what I've done. Well, Ahab takes off in his chariot. Elijah is so pumped up that he runs ahead of the chariot and beats Ahab down there. Well, Ahab goes in and tells Jezebel what it is. Well, she's mad. It doesn't, that doesn't change her mind at all. Now she says, well, I want to do to Elijah what he did to my prophets. I want to put him to the sword. That scares Elijah. Here he's had a great victory. He has accomplished things. So he takes off and runs out to the desert. He gets out there and he prays to God to take his life. He's had a burnout. He's burned out. He's, he saw things that he's done and that to no avail. So he's ready to lay his life down. Jesus, at the same time, if you might recall, when he had great multitudes that were following him out into the wilderness, and he had to feed them. He had crowds there. 
And at one point, he says a little something about the, about the blood and the flesh and this kind of thing. And the crowds sort of start melting away. Now, he's had great success in his own life. This is Jesus our Lord now. He's had great success, but then all the crowds that were following start dwindling away. If we look at John 6, 66, let's look at that for a second. Gospel of John. It reads, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away also? Now remember, they've been with Jesus approximately three years now. He's been performing miracles. Many wonders to prove who he was, that he was a Messiah. He thought that he had done that. He wasn't, I'm sure, he, he was... Lord Almighty, he knew what was going on, but yet he's like us. We, we have our trials and tribulations. We, we have our wonder, uh, or we wonder about things. Jesus was in the flesh. I'm sure he was wondering also, was his 12 really going to be with him or not? He selected them. He handpicked them. So I'm sure his fleshly self wondered, are they going to stay with me or not? Now, if you were one of the apostles, how would you have handled that? Could you have stayed with this guy who you've been following for three years and him telling you that, hey, we're going we're to establish a kingdom and I'm showing these miracles so that the people will come to me and then at some point the kingdom will be established. It wasn't happening. It wasn't happening as fast as they thought it would happen. They didn't understand. We have an understanding today. They did not have that same understanding back then. We have the privilege of hindsight, of the Word of God. We've got that privilege to look and learn. But they didn't. So I imagine there was, there was times in their lives that they... they were tempted to give up. We have all in our lives experienced hardships like that. Now how do we handle them? I don't really know. That's to each of us. We do know that when we begin a new job, new challenges, hardships, we tend to pass the test. We tend to achieve. But when it becomes easier for us, we meet another test. And that's the test of burnout. Do we get burnt out? If we, uh, it, it's at this time 
that we need spiritual renewal in our lives. We need to recall what it was like to go back in our lives, to recall that enthusiasm we had as newborn Christians, how that that was an exciting times in our lives, how that we could achieve things. We we need that periodically all through our lives. But how do we get spiritual renewal? How do we achieve that? In Hebrews 10:25. 10 to 25. Let's look at that just a second. It's a little hint of how, the, how we can start doing that. In Hebrews 10, 25, it reads... Let me go back up here to 24 just a little bit. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is a matter of some, but ex exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. He's telling us here that we need to meet together as we're doing here, so that we can speak of our Lord and Jesus. He also, in Hebrews 1, 5, 13, he's, he's, there's a poem there. And in this poem, it is sort of relaying the story that brought them to Christianity it's a poem, and it's telling of Jesus to try to, to try to revive them again. It reads, you are my son. Today, I have begotten you. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Let all the angels of God worship him and of the angels he says who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire but to the son he says your throne O God is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom you have loved righteousness and hated lewd lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. I'm sure that they were also telling us of the miracles and the mighty wonders that Jesus did. Let's go to, to first these first these Thessalonians. Uh, First Thessalonians six. First uh, Thessalonians uh, chapter one, verse six. And he's, in this, in Thessalonians, he's reciting to the Thessalonians, but I'm sure it was some of this that he also recited to other people as they became weary. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia 
Achaia, who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He was trying to build them back up. The other thing that we can do, we meet together. We share the word together. The other thing we can do is return to God's work. Let's go back to Kings real quick. Kings 19. Visit Elijah just for a second. <coughs> In 1 Kings 19, 15 through 18. Now remember, Elijah sitting out in the desert. He's praying for death. He's seen his great victories, what he had thought would be accomplishment. All of a sudden, they weren't. So he goes to the desert to basically die. He's burnt out. But how does he, how does God, now God's dealing directly with him. How does God revive him? In 1518, maybe we'll get a little glimpse of that. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Demsha, as king over Israel. And Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. What did God do to Elijah? He sent him out. He said, don't stay here and stay in this burnout condition. You go out and go back to work. So he assigned him a job to do so that Elijah could get back. He started working again. Um, one of the remedies for a saving spirit was to return to his duties. The stories of the Bible is the history of people who at some times in their lives were ready to give it all up. They were ready to give it up. But we still have the stories in the Bible and we recall them. Today, because they didn't give up. They stayed close to others who could encourage them. They recall the excitement of the beginnings of their faith. They returned to work. This is a prescription for us how that we might regain our spiritual vitality. Well, I don't think I quite filled up. I've got 10 minutes left, and that's all I've got. <laughs> anyway, any questions? Have any of y'all experienced a burnout in your lives? Don't be hesitant. We all have. How about spiritual burnouts? You recall having a spiritual burnout? I can, I can have, I, I've had many, many, believe me. 
You know, it's, it's the odd thing is I think that as we get older, our, uh, and this has proved out a lot, I think, in, in some of the things that I've read, how that older men become more, uh, wanting to learn more of the Bible. They become more spiritually involved as they get older. I know from my case that's it. As a young man, I was baptized here when I was 13. I can't say that I received the Holy Spirit at that time. I, I can pretty much say I didn't. And I lived most of my life in a state of believing but yet not one really accepted. So I gave up a good part of my life still going to church, still doing the religious things, but I gave up a good part of my life not really giving to the Lord. As I got older, probably, I, my birthday was here two days ago. I'm 76 years old. <laughs> Happy birthday, man. <laughs> But I really didn't get a really a good, good feeling for what Christ meant, means in my life, what, what it really means to me until probably six, seven years ago. And I got interested in the book. And it's made such a difference in me. Now, y'all may not see that, but it, I know here it's made a difference in me. I'm sure that some of you have been also been in that same light. But the one thing that has helped me is, is reading the book, trying to understand, not just reading it, not just reading it to be reading, but reading it to understand, to try to figure out what the Bible was saying to those people back then so that I can understand how it applies to me today. Because everything in the Bible does not apply to us today. It's in there for our learning. Paul tells us that the whole scripture is for our learning and understanding. But it's not all for us. It's not all there per se for us. Who still believes in sacrificing? Uh, but it's in the Bible, Old Testament. We don't adhere to that. Kind of weird. Catholics go through Lent and they give, a, they give up for one month their, their favorite thing. And so they kind of do. Who is this now? The Catholics. You know, they, they do Lent. Yeah. That, that's an interesting concept. Are we under that? What does Paul say? That's sort of the, that was part of the old law, wasn't it? Are we under the old law? Under the gospel of grace? Are we under the old law? We're not. We don't have to meet here Sunday. There's nothing that says we have to be here other than the fact we want to be. When that indwelling the Holy Spirit comes into you. You don't have to be here, but you want to be here. Under the law, it says you got to be here. You got to go to the synagogue. You got to be a temple worshiper and this sort of thing. Well, do you want to be? Because when you said about you were here even though you were kind of drifted off, I know I went through that and I think I came because I was afraid of mom. <laughs> and so you yeah. But your mind is way off. I got my ear pulled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but <laughs> maybe a little Hard spot on the rear. Thinking about Elijah, and when he got burned out, he thought his job was done. But God had something to do for him. I think sometimes we are that way, especially when we get to your age. <laughs> hello, hello, right here with me. <laughs> it's like, well, we're here, but what is our job? What has God given us a job to do? Can we convert people? Can we, we can be benevolent? But we need to search for, if 
God's not going to speak to us directly, we can find things that we still can do at whatever age or stage we are in our Christianity. Yeah. And God found it something for him to do. But he did find a successor for him. They go and find Elisha. And he's going to be the next prophet. True. So whether did Elijah retire after that? It doesn't tell us, does it? <laughs> We we've got we've got a lot of times we've got to use our own imagination about things. It's not not everything that's told us here, but that's that's the beautiful beautiful part of that. You know, speaking of the law, you know the Ten Commandments. Pretty, I, I see when I go down here to the to the uh, church down here, they got the Ten Commandments on the pins, and those are good. They still apply to us. We're not under those Ten Commandments there. We're not under the law. But we have them in our heart. Because we have grace does not give us license to do anything we want to. We don't have license to break the Ten Commandments. But because we have the Holy Spirit within us, because of believing in Jesus, His death, burial, and resurrection, Without that resurrection, where is our faith? What does it say? Our faith is vain. It's of no use. If we don't believe in the resurrection, the Holy Spirit is not going to indwell us. Now, we can be religious. We can work our tails off. We can do all those things, but in some ways it's vain and vain. That's a hard concept now. Most people going to church today, not necessarily in this group here, but most churchgoers today stop. They believe in the life of Jesus, a good man. He shed his blood on the cross for our sins. And that's what they believe in. But we're told in the Bible that if we don't believe in the resurrection, it's in vain. Bill? One of the passages that I go to periodically when I get lost is Jude. And Jude describes a bad circumstance in life. And we're, we can see these same circumstances around our lives by looking at anything. It's obvious. Shoulders, whatever he had on, and you can go and 
I thank y'all for listening. I hope I didn't bore you too much.
speaking this morning. We're glad that they have been here this summer, uh, Joe and Peyton, and um, Jeff Burge is not here, so I'm standing up here doing announcements. And maybe you can endure it. The announcements on the back of the program, I'll just mention a few. Uh, we had a busy summer with the children, and Joe and Peyton have been working hard with them. Uh, the 29th, you look at the Kingston teens and the Kingston kids on the back. I won't try to read all that for you. And the Golden Gophers, that's, uh, you might say, a, a senior group of teens. Uh, we'll be going to Dayton, Tennessee. Donna Fisher's moving. We hate to make that announcement, but wish your best for you, Donna. Uh, Holly Woodley is having some health issues as Lee Beecham and Betty Mauer is not. She's here. She led exercise the day after she got out of the hospital, so you can't get in the way of Betty. She's ready to go. Um, so anyway, we're glad you're here. It's a great day. Any day we're up and going, we can be thankful to God and say, thank you, God, for the day we have. We don't have tomorrow. We don't have this afternoon. We don't have yesterday, but we have right now. And thank you, God, for that. We're glad uh, Brent to be leading the sing this morning, so take it away, Brent. Please stand as we sing. Standing on the promises of Christ my King through eternal ages. Let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. On the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I cannot fail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing.
Scripture reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 16, verses 10 and 11. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're indeed blessed and so thankful to be gathered here as your sons and daughters this morning to worship you. Father, we pray that as we approach your throne this morning that you'll forgive us of our sins. We pray that you'll help us each day to live more faithfully for you than the day before. Help us to always be focused heavenward and, and not on earthly things. Father, we're thankful for the daily blessings you give us, for our health and for our homes, for our clothing and the food that we have. We have it in abundance in this land, and we're thankful for that. We're thankful for the peace that we enjoy in this country. We're thankful for the men and women that serve in the armed forces for our country, and we pray for your blessings of protection on them. Father, we thank you for the love and the grace you give us each day. Thank you for Jesus, for the sacrifice he made for our sins. Thank you for your spirit that dwells in us and help us, helps us to live as the people you'd have us to be. We're thankful for your word. We have access to it all the time. We pray that you'll help us to live in it, help us to live the words that you give us in it. Father, help us to live with increasing love and grace with one another and with everybody that we come in contact with. Help us to forgive one another. Father, we just pray that you'll be with Joe this morning as he brings us a lesson from your word. We're thankful for him to, to share that with us pray that you'll just continue to be with us as we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, keep
Paul writes to the Philippians, in Philippians 2, reminding them of the attitude that they should have. And I think it's appropriate for a time such as this, when we come together and we gather and to remember the Lord and what he has done for us. Paul writes to them and he says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something that is to be grasped or held on to. A very interesting concept there. He was equal with God, but he didn't think that he should hold on to that and grasp it. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So here is God coming down and being in the form of Danny. Hmm, not exactly the greatest. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. So how does that fit in with us? Well, it reminds us that Jesus died for us, made himself lower than the angels, for us because he loved us. And he was willing to even die. But not only that, it reminds me, Danny, every week you have to have the attitude of Christ and die to yourself if you're going to live for him. You see, I can't live for him when I'm living for myself. I have to die to self in order to live for him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together. This time that we can remember all that you have done for us. This time we remember you died on our behalf so that we may have forgiveness of sin and enjoy life with you eternally. Father, help us also to remember that it is a time to remind us to die to ourselves so that we can live for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Give thanks for the cup. Father, just as you gave your body on our behalf, your blood was shed so that we may have that forgiveness. We remember that at this time. We remember that it was because of your love for us that you shed your blood so that we may have forgiveness. In Jesus' name. Amen. We are a blessed people. God has blessed each of you, no matter how much is in your billfold or your saving your, or your bank account. He has blessed us all. For the fact that we're here today, we have life. For the fact that we live in the United States of America and have freedom that we have, he has blessed us. Now we get a turn to share our blessings with him. There's a box in the back. If you want to share and give, you can do that as you leave if you did not do that when you came in. Let's have a prayer. Father, you have blessed us, and we are thankful for that. We are thankful for the privilege of assembling and worshiping you as we see fit this day. We are thankful to you for life that you give us. We're thankful to you for brothers and sisters in Christ. We're thankful to you for, for Jesus. We're thankful for you for the blessings you pour upon us each day. Now, Father, may we give with humble hearts 
and with glad hearts as we share to forward the work here in your kingdom. For this we pray in the name of Jesus. And amen. you've done I will thank you for all that you're going to do for all that you've promised and all that you are is all that has carried me through Jesus I thank you and I thank you thank you
success and do we sacrifice enough for it? Um, but first, uh, I had a couple announcements. Just a reminder that um, this Tuesday, the kids are going to be having a cookout um, at whatever time. And then the teens are going to be at the gravel pit for another cookout um, and a lake day at 5 o'clock. So invite their friends to both, and it'll be great. Um, but yeah, so... Um, we're going to be talking about success and how do we sacrifice for it. That's not right. There it goes. All right. Um, who do you guys think is successful in you guys' opinions? Do you measure success on who you influence? Do you measure it off of your net worth, your value, and currency, and what you like hold in your possessions? Or do you measure it in like all kinds of things. So for the first one, um, we're gonna be talking about, do you measure it off of how smart you are? A lot of people measure it, especially um, college students and high schoolers, they measure their value and their success off of having a 4.0 GPA, or how many clubs they're in, or what activities they do, or who they influence in their lives. Um, and I think that's important, but I don't think it's the full thing. And um, some of the people that they really look up to instead of God are, for instance, um, like Albert Einstein, Isaac Newton, and like Martin Luther King, stuff like that, who influenced the world forever. Um, or do you measure it mostly on like a monetary value? So like some of the wealthiest people in the world aren't Jeff Bezos now. It's, it was Henry Ford, it was Rockefeller, it was um, Augustus Caesar, and all of them were extremely successful because they not only had a great net worth, but they also influenced millions of people forever. Um, and like a lot of people were like, oh, I'll be successful when I have a million dollars or $10 million or hundred dollars in my bank account that I don't have student loans when I'm 50. Um, so they're like the combined their net worth was over 5.1 trillion dollars and they obviously didn't think they were as successful as they could have been because to the day they died they were still trying to earn more money, conquer more land, um, gain people's respect or do some people measure success off of what they control. Um, some people are like, I'm successful because I have three beach houses and eight cars and a motorcycle. Um, but some people control land. Um, so like you have Genghis Khan, you have um, Alexander the Great and, some, and Napoleon who combined had over eight million square miles of land, which is insane to think about that these aren't acres, like miles of land. Um, and people, their success is based off of, I own a 10 square, acre, 10 square acre lot up in Malibu. Like, that's who we look up to, um, which isn't always the biggest thing. Um, sorry, I can't see up there, so. Um, so some of the most successful people, what do they have to say? Um, the first one is from Henry Hines, which, he didn't have the biggest net worth, but still, in today's money, he had a ton. Um, and what he had to say was, to do a uncommon thing, or a common thing uncommonly brings success. Um, which a lot of people think you have to reinvent the wheel to be successful, and that's not necessarily the case. Some of the times, you just have to be able to see it differently. And that's like us in Christ of, like, we don't have to reinvent what he writes down in the Bible. We don't have to reinvent on how to go and fellowship with people. Um, we just have to try our best and do it good to be successful. Um, another person that was successful was John D. Rockefeller. Um, and he said, if you want to succeed, you should strike out your own path rather than travel the warm paths of accepted success. Um, 
which is pretty huge to think about. It kind of goes with that um, of there's already paths there, but you just have to be able to see them. Um, the potential with people is huge in our congregation and congregations around this area of the path is the people in our community. Um, but do we see their potential and make strides to strike out that path so we could see them, see the beauty in them so that they can see the beauty in God? The next one is um, from Ben Franklin, one of our founding fathers. He said, without continual growth and progress, such words as improvement, achievement, and success have no meaning. Um, and that applies to us because do we grow on a daily basis? Not like, oh, does my bank account grow on a daily basis when I go into work? Does my friend group grow? Um, do we grow? Do, does our community grow around us because of us? Um, otherwise, everything else that we work towards is pretty menial. Like, there's no purpose in our bank account growing if you don't spend it in God's glory or in our community to help further other people. Um, the next one is from Picasso, um, who helped change the world as far as art and how people see beauty in things. And he said, action is a fundamental key of success. Um, so to kind of think on your guys' life, do you guys keep moving? Not like, do you get out of bed every day, but do you get out and go and talk to people at work? Do you get out after work and continue to work on your own faith, your own future? Um, so yeah, and then the next one is Henry Ford. And what he had, one sec, where's that? Oh, he said, coming together is the beginning. Keeping together is progress and working together is success. And I think that applies to every aspect of our life, especially in church, especially in business, um, especially in our home life, as we could come together every week and accomplish almost nothing. Um, and then we could keep together, which is good. Um, and we have a pretty good group here this morning. And at most events, we have a pretty decent sized group. Um, but the difference is like, do we work together? Do we come to events and like, do you volunteer? Do you help fund it financially or like with prayer? Do you help if someone is in need of something, is your main priority is man, are they going to pay me? Or is it going to be, man, I really need to help them. And then if they pay you at the end, cool. If not, that's even better because you got to do God's work and you got the gratification towards yourself. Um, the next part is what do we have in common and why is it, what do they have in common and why is it important? Um, so they all require challenging yourself, um, which is pretty big because a lot of us like comfort. Um, we have comfortable cars that have huge touch screens. We have um, comfortable houses that we have to take pillows off our bed every night to sleep on it. Um, do we challenge ourselves out of our comfort zone? Do we challenge the thoughts that are told every day? Um, I'm not claiming to know everything. I'm sure John could say the same thing and everyone else in this room could say the same thing. But do you ever challenge outside of what you already know? Um, do you ever challenge the, the people in your community of when someone says, ah, I'm not super comfortable with going on a hike. I'm not super comfortable with going to class today. Um, I'd rather not try that food because it has like sesame seeds on the bun. Like it's all medial stuff, but do you ever challenge yourself to break that comfort zone? Um, the next part is to be radical in your thinking. So Christ was pretty radical in his time frame. Um, he said things that people never thought, did things never, they never thought about. And I think we should be the same is every aspect of our life is again, based off of comfort. How can we help ourselves or how can we help just our community? Um, a more all these successful people that we talked about before and probably who you were thinking of, 
they stepped outside their comfort zone. They took an idea that wasn't, for most people, a good idea. Um, for instance, like McDonald's. Most people, the tradition was you sit down in your car and they bring your food to you and you have a small burger that is good, okay? Um, that was hand cooked, all that stuff. And then um, they blew that out of the water by saying, we'll bring it to you fast and it's cheap, it's inexpensive, and you don't have to tip or do anything. That was an insane idea, but it's one of the most successful businesses nowadays as far as fast food. Um, like that with our faith, should we be more radical? Um, are you comfortable with reading just the New Testament and hearing only about God's love and not how God also required sacrifice of more than 10%? Um, or learning that um, for instance, when he wa when they walk on water, um, that we all hear, oh, he's, he fell in the water. But that was an insane idea to walk out on water. Do we even think about walking on water? Um, the next part is about sacrifice. Um, all of those people required sacrifice. It took their home life. It took their finances, their life savings, um, some their sanity, mostly artists. Um, it took radical views, and it took split, taking time away from their family. Um, God required sacrifice. He still does. He requires sacrifice of our time, our energy, our mind space, everything. Um, so as far as that goes, do you guys feel like you sacrifice enough? Um, and for the last one, it requires action from you. All the successful people that have ever lived... The only reason they were successful is they went out on a limb and took action. Um, whether they saw a problem, whether they saw an improvement, whether they just needed a leader, fundamentals of how to do something, or anything. They took action. And do we take action? So, the next thing is why Christians should be radical in their thinking and why it's so fulfilling. So, the apostles had a rough life um, from the beginning. They were called to drop everything, including their, a lot of the times, their friends, their communities, their form of income, everything. Um, and then they took off to go and be persecuted their entire life until death um, is the sad reality of it. So that seems pretty hard. Same instance for Christ. He, did, he had the same struggles. He was born instantly was seen as kind of an outcast in all reality of why does he know more about the bible than people that have been studying his whole life no one likes to know it all for the most part but that didn't bug him um no one likes the apostles that are just like oh the kids can't come see him like that was their way of thinking at the time um and now we live in a life full of lawlessness lawlessness and sin and we need to and a lot of us are just like, well, they had it rougher then, or we have it rougher now. It's equally as rough. It's just a different kind of thing. So the next part is, um, do we sacrifice enough? That is weird how small it is. Um, so a lot of the times we're just like, oh, that's easy. I, I sacrifice enough. I'll go Sunday morning, and I gauge off my extra sleep, and I'll sit through class and doze off every now and then. Or... Yeah, I can help people out when I can. I'll hold the door when I walk through. Um, that's pretty good. I mean, none of these things are bad, but they get the more you get into it. Um, what if I cut back on watching sports and TV? And that's not usually a Sunday morning thing to talk about because it sucks, but um, to study more. Like, how, how often do you guys watch TV and sports? Or go play sports? Or spend time practicing for something, whether it's instruments or anything, um, and instead of praying and studying. Um, well, what if we go do something uncomfortable? Like, what if we go on a mission trip? What if we go door knocking? What if we invite our friend that we know isn't a big fan of church, but he still needs God, you know? Um, will we go and talk to them and risk them not being a part of our lives, risk us using 
our money that we're going to spend on a nice beach vacation to go to a third world country and take a shower out of buckets. Um, anything that we want to be comfortable, but is that enough? And my thing towards that is none of it's enough and we can't really sacrifice enough because we're called to spend every bit of our lives praying, studying, um, talking to people. That's not to say that we can't enjoy life. Um, God created all these things and helped us have the mentality to create things that we will enjoy so that we can help glorify them in different ways. So you could, um, by sacrificing, is just figuring out how to sacrifice while doing those things. Um, but we need to know that sacrifice is needed in this. Um, we have Christ now, but that's not to say that we still shouldn't sacrifice. Um, every successful person that's ever lived has sacrificed well more than we can think of for the most part. Um, the biggest downside to all this is we can't be successful by ourselves. Um, just like everyone before and everyone to come and all that, is they didn't do it by themselves. Henry Ford couldn't have made Ford Motor Company without the assembly line. Um, you know, Julius Caesar or Augustus Caesar or any of the Caesars, um, including Little Caesar, can't run a successful country or business without having employees, workers, armies, um, and money. Okay, he can't. They can't do it by themselves, um, and neither should we. Um, so I think a lot of the times we take that to heart too much. That we need to figure out how to run things by ourselves because we don't want someone else to mess it up. Or this was our brainchild that we need to nurture and take care of and um, help grow, but we're afraid that anyone else is going to take advantage of it or steal the idea or take credit. So if you go, for instance, on a mission trip, a lot of the times you're like, oh, I wanna be a part of this, I wanna be a part of this. And are we doing it because we want to help or are we doing it so that we can get in all the pictures so when you come back, you're like, look at what I did. I built five houses and helped all these kids and stuff like that to make us look good. Successful people don't typically wor worry about that. Um, nowadays, you have athletes that will post everything online um, of how many cars they have, how big their houses are, stuff like that. For the most part, they're successful now, but they're not successful later on in life. Um, they don't have, they have the joy now, but later on they won't have that joy. The truly successful people um, that's more relatable to now are, say, Mark Zuckerberg, who walks around in sweatpants and a white t-shirt off of eBay. You know, um, you don't hear about all the fancy stuff he's doing. You just hear, this is his net worth every year that comes out. He puts in the work, he puts in the time. Same with Bill Gates. He's not wearing fancy clothes, driving all the fancy cars, trying to be in media. The difference between him and a lot of the successful people we see is that he knows what he's worth. And we should know what we're worth um, when it comes to Christ. Um, that we're worth every bit of it. I mean, he gave his son. He gave the time to create the earth. Um, and he's successful for that. And we're successful because we have him. Um, so, yeah. That's weird. Anyways, I skipped the last slide. Um, so, um, and it's typically easy to sacrifice for what we have. Um, like, our version of sacrifice isn't much. It's give up a couple hours of your day um, for something that will look good. Um, the other things is that I'm not saying that we can't be successful without putting in a ton of work. Um, it requires a lot of work. Typically, most successful people that are successful aren't successful for two or three years. Um, they're successful forever because from the day they start it 
to the day they die, they're going. Um, a lot of us, especially with faith, is we'll get on a project. So say we'll, we're like, oh, we're going to help with VBS. Um, and you got, start going for one day, two days, something like that. And you feel really good about it for a, a week, a month, a year, something like that, where that's your thing. But successful people, the mentality there is that they go forever. They're not happy with where they are today. They won't be happy with where they are tomorrow. They take pride in what they have. They take pride in what they've accomplished, but they, don't, they aren't going to just give up because they earned their first million. Um, and that's the same with us when it comes to church is we shouldn't take pride in what we have already accomplished. Um, we should be happy that it's happened. We should be happy that God blessed us with it. But we should continually grow, continually ask, how can I be better? How can I study more? How can I reach out to the people, even within our congregation? Um, I'm not the best about it because I don't know all that much about you guys. But how much do you know about the people sitting in the row next to you? Um, do you know what their struggles were? because that's another key to success is understanding the struggles in the community around you and yourself of, look, they're struggling with something too, so I'm gonna help them through it, and it'll in turn help me, and that'll bring me one step closer to success. Um, and I think I actually ran out of slides, but um, the, the biggest thing to take away from all this is we can all be successful. And success is measured in different ways, um, so don't feel like you aren't successful, because you are. Uh, success is measured in how many memories you have, how good of works you've done, and how you grow. Sometimes growing isn't just like your bank account. Um, sometimes growing is accepting that there's a hard part of your life coming up and you just have to take the hits as they come and be able to weather through the storm. Um, so all of us are successful people, but are we going to stay successful at the end of the day? So I'm gonna pray and I think that's the end of my slides. Um, dear God, thank you for bringing us here together. Thank you for the community you formed between us. Help us to see success in everything that we do. Help us to have joy in the success that you brought to us. Um, help us to realize the sacrifices we need in our community and the sacrifice we need for ourselves. Thank you, God, for your son and for the blessings you bring us every day. In Christ's name, amen. Oh, there it is. That's great. Anyways.
Well, I said I didn't have announcements, but I, there is one that I was given uh, later on in worship. Uh, if you've been keeping track of the, <clears throat> excuse me, of the uh, Kingston Weekly, uh, on the back page, uh, talked about Jake Sexton, friends of the rectors. He was 35 years old. He was battling cancer, and he had passed away this past Friday. So let's keep the rectors and their family in, in our prayers. Think about them. Uh, I would like to say one other thing. Joe, thank you for the lesson this morning on being successful. And um, our prayers, or my prayer this morning, for each and every person here, is that whether it be physically or mentally, I hope each and every one of us are successful this week and the weeks to come. At this time, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer as we dismiss from our worship. Our most kind and merciful, merciful Heavenly Father, we humbly come to Thee at this time. Thanking Thee, Father, for allowing us to come here this morning to sing songs to Thee, to worship Thee, to learn another portion of Thy Word. Help us, Father, to be success, successful, if it be Thy will whether it be physically or mentally. Help us, Father, to study this week, to, le to learn more about your love for us and what you would have us do. Father, be with the rectors and be with Jake Sexton's family and friends as they mourn his loss, leaving this world. Father, be with each and every each of us as we go our separate ways. Father, we are weak and we sin, we do sin, and we ask thee to help us to recognize this and turn away from that sin and to look towards thee to be more like Jesus as he was here on this earth. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.